Good. So, um, today we'll finish the topic regarding uh, the development of uh, web applications, and we'll, uh, we're going to add uh, the last uh, uh, ring in the chain uh, concerning the, the client-side programming with JavaScript. Uh, you may remember, you should remember, <laughs> that uh, last time we uh, were playing with this uh, uh, application, remember the to-do list uh, always, and uh, we try to add some interactivity about, uh, for example, the control uh, whether the, the text is empty or not uh, by adding some JavaScript programming into the web page. Hmm? And we learned that it could be done by loading into the template some scripts uh, and uh, writing the script uh, in the JavaScript language. Right now we have, uh, let's say, two, uh, or today we're trying to solve two main issues. One is uh, uh, that in many cases, the direct manipulation of the DOM, the, the DOM of the document, uh, can be heavy and complex. And uh, it's easy to fall into incompatibility between the browsers. So actually the basic, basic, uh, the basic JavaScript programming uh, is a bit difficult when, you're, when, when you try to do something complex with the DOM. And so this is the first issue for which uh, we are going to learn uh, the jQuery library, which is re really widely used, uh, that simplifies a lot uh, the kind of programming that we need. The second uh, issue, which is more architectural, is that uh, if you remember what we had to do in the HTML huh, for inserting the JavaScript uh, code, we had to register event handler for capturing, for example, the click events. And uh, in this case, we just needed to add one attribute on click for registering some JavaScript code. In this case, we're just calling the check form function and uh, executing that when a specific event gets, uh, is generated in the, um, in the interactive web page. This is, okay, it uh, it's, works well, but uh, it mm, creates a dependency between the, the HTML page and so ideally the people who are going to design the HTML templates and the JavaScript implementation. Mm -hmm. So uh, you need the, the, the template developer, a guy working with the, with the HTML, to know the names and the locations of the JavaScript functions that are needed to, to handle these uh, events. This is not nice. It would be better that the HTML page would be clean uh, without any reference to the JavaScript methods, and then the JavaScript itself could add, could attach their own event handler in all the locations that we want. Actually, we are in some way tagging twice the same uh, information. So, for example, instead of adding the title clicked event onto this div, it would be easy for the JavaScript code just to target the Jumbo's wrong element hmm? in some way. So the JavaScript should know where to attach instead of the HTML knowing which JavaScript code wants to be attached. It, for simple application, it doesn't matter. But for larger applications, it's better to have uh, the, um, to develop the HTML without the knowledge of the kind of JavaScript that we need. Otherwise. Every time we need to add something in JavaScript, uh, we need to go back to the HTML and add the event tender here and there and modify them. Hmm? And it gets heavy to maintain, basically. So uh, these two problems are, can be solved quite easily by using this uh, uh, jQuery library. Hmm? jQuery is a JavaScript library. It's uh, very famous. It's also very, very historically uh, 
um, you know, these slides uh, date back for nearly 10 years uh, and they, are, they still, you know, give you the fundamentals for this library. So this library has been, has been tested by time, no? in more than 10 years, people's, people are, are, are using that in, in a lot of different applications. And uh, it, uh, um, you know, helps you very much in dealing with the basic loop of event-driven applications. Uh, so just remember what, what we, how we think uh, no, in uh, interface uh, design, in, uh, in uh, interactive applications when we are designing the front end. First, uh, you decide which events uh, need to be captured. In this case, the click event on this container or the click event uh, on, the, uh, on the submission button. Then you have an event handler that gets some information from the page and may modify some other information on the page. So identify the event, get some elements, query these elements to get the information and maybe modify some properties of other elements. So the two basic uh, activities are finding elements in the page and finding the properties so the current value of the property of, the, of these elements, and then modifying the value of the properties of the same element. These properties could be a text property in, a, in an input area, so that we know what the user wrote, or could be a CSS style that we want to add or, or delete, so that an element will become visible or invisible or highlighted or change color, depending on uh, uh, what happens. Mm -hmm. And jQuery just automates or simplifies a lot these basic functionalities. So uh, let's focus on how the library is working. Of course, uh, jQuery is a JavaScript library, so you need to include that. But luckily, uh, the, uh, the Bootstrap Flash module is already included in that, so we don't need to do anything special. And this library just defines one function. Okay, there's one function with a lot of different, uh, let's say, methods and, uh, and ways to be called, but uh, the whole library only defines one function, which is called jQuery. And uh, uh, so everything you want to do with this library usually calls this function jQuery to do something. Uh, since you are, you are going to be writing a lot of times the jQuery uh, a string, name of this function, uh, the library also defines a shortcut, a short end for the same uh, function. And this short end is called dollar, dollar sign. So dollar sign is, may seem strange, but it's a legal character for variable names in JavaScript. So dollar is just like X, like B, like F, uh, just a, a letter, which is a synonym, no, it's a totally uh, say, uh, an alias, a completely interchangeable between uh, dollar and jQuery. So it's up to you whether you want to write jQuery in the long form or just you want to write dollar. And see a lot of, of code with just dollar just because it's shorter. Hmm? Um, so the basic functions are finding elements, finding properties of elements, and changing properties of elements. This is the work of you and handlers. How does uh, jQuery simplify uh, finding elements? Uh, jQuery, let's say, uses the same syntax that you, we already know from the CSS, from the style sheets, to give you the element that you need. So uh, why in basic JavaScript you cannot do that? The only way of finding nodes is get element by, by tag name or by ID or by class, but it's a very, there's a very limited set of functions that you can use uh, in basic JavaScript for finding elements in the DOM. In jQuery, it's much easier. You just uh, uh, write a selector, like you would write in CSS for modifying the style of an element, and you pass this selector to uh, the jQuery function. So this tells jQuery, find me the element with ID equal to nav. And in this case, it will return me one jQuery node that corresponds to that element. Hmm? 
mm, maybe a div, maybe a p, maybe a paragraph, eh, whatever, or an image, the element with id equal to nav. Mm. Or in the second case, div hash intro space h2. So give me all the h2 elements, heading two, which are inside a div with id equal to intro. So it searches all the three, whether you have a div element whose id is intro, and if it finds it, then it recursively inside this div, it finds all the h2 elements. So in this case, it will return a list of elements, not just one, a list of elements, and all of them are the h2 element that we want. Um, and you may also be more, more complex, uh, uh, the link, uh, and a link element, A, an anchor element, inside the list item, inside the nav, uh, uh, the, the element with the ID equal to nav, and so on. So every time you call the jQuery function with a, with a string, this string is expected to be a selector, a CSS selector, and uh, the, the result of the function is one element or a list of elements in general that match the selector. These are the DOM nodes that match this selector. If, of course, the, the short form of this is just using the dollar sign instead of the digit query. This is exactly the same as before. We will use the dollar because it's faster. Okay, uh, you can use all the CSS selector also with some extensions. These are some examples. So, uh, uh, element name, square bracket, attribute equal to value. So if you want to find the input element with the name such and such, this, uh, uh, there is no selector directly for, for matching the name element. You can match the ID, you can match the class with the CSS syntax, but not other kinds of attributes. Uh, with the square brackets, you can match any attribute you want on a specific element, and so on. Hmm? Uh, you have uh, uh, all the information that you need from, uh, for jQuery are in the jQuery.com website. jQuery, uh, the, this website contains uh, or links uh, different products. One is jQuery itself, uh, and the second one is jQuery UI, which if you wanted, you can look at it later, uh, contains user interface elements. So something more complex for doing tab layout or for doing uh, you know, calendar widgets and so on. So, mm, sort of plugins to jQuery that enhance it, its functionality uh, with new interactive elements. But basically, we, we basically need uh, jQuery, and all the information we need uh, is in the documentation. This API documentation, so we want to uh, understand how you can select elements. You have a whole section here called selectors, and then you have the full list of possible selectors for selecting attributes, descendants, equality, and so on. So it's, it's much more than basic CSS. So you can use all the CSS syntax that we already know, plus special, let's say, syntax for selecting other, other elements. The complete set of rules for CSS selectors plus some others that are just defined in jQuery. So we have this full set of capabilities. Um, well, I, I won't go into details here, but there are you know, selectors that are not just CSS, as I said. So uh, maybe you want to treat the first paragraph in a block differently from the others. So we have special first or all headers in a table. Uh, so you match different kinds of elements. So some, something uh, which would make your life easier. Um, so in some cases, you, only, you are only matching one element, but in general, uh, a jQuery call will match uh, uh, more elements. So, in general, the jQuery call will return not just one element, but a collection of elements, okay? Um, 
in JavaScript, a collection is uh, an array. It's treated like an array element. So actually, when you're calling jQuery of div.section, it will return a list or an array, call it as you like, of all the divs, all the div elements with class equal to section. And to access each of them, uh, you may subscript the array. So 0, 1, 2, this is the first, second, third one. Match the element. Hmm? If you want to know how many of them, okay, this is an array, and an array, the array object has a length property that will tell you how many elements are there, right? Um, so this is a way called jQuery to have a bunch of elements, and for each of them, or, or say, uh, analyze them one by one. Uh, but jQuery is even more powerful because if you want to um, manipulate in some way a collection of elements, automatically jQuery will apply that function to each and every of them. So you don't need explicitly to do a loop for saying, okay, change, make, I don't know, I want to make an element uh, or to highlight it. I want to add a class to an element to make it stand out, huh? to highlight uh, these kind of elements. I don't need to do a loop, uh, highlight the first one, so div section zero dot uh, add class highlighted, uh, div section one I dot a class highlighted, and so on. But I will just call the manipulation method on the collection itself. And automatically jQuery will apply that method onto every element of the collection. So you are, you are writing really combat code. You are uh, dealing with, uh, um, let, uh, with uh, a, a lot of elements at the same time in just one call. Hmm? And uh, so th this takes us to the next step. Once I select some elements, what can I do with them? Well, the basic functionality is I can modify their content. So if I have a span element, I can modify the text inside. Or in general, for any element, I can modify the inside HTML code. So I can actually modify a part of the page by replacing the current text or the current HTML with a new one. Hmm? If I have a string that represents uh, the, the code that I want. Uh, or I can modify some attributes for the elements. And uh, uh, for example, I am matching a.nav. A.nav means all the A elements with class equal to nav, navigation probably. For all of them, I change the attribute href, which is a normal attribute for the A element, for the links, to this new value. So I'm actually hijacking, uh, redirecting all the links uh, with class navigation to this other URL, URL. So if they point to some page, now I'm making them point to something else. If the selector only matches one, well, then only one attribute is changed. But if the selector will match many elements, each of them will have their attribute changed. Um, so I can change with the Add method on jQuery object, all the attributes by giving the name of an attribute and the new value. Hmm? Or in some cases, in this case, I can also remove an attribute. So I can change them as I want. It's more useful to modify elements on the basis of CSS classes. So I, we already know in Bootstrap we are adding a lot of classes to change the appearance of elements. We can do that also dynamically. So it's very easy to add or remove a class or toggle, a class for an, uh, an element or a, of, or a set of elements. So for example, I match in this case uh, in ID selector, so only one will be returned, but if it would be a collection, it's the same. Uh, adding one class, so it's like you, add, you are adding to the current list of classes a new one, dynamically to those elements, or remove them, or toggle, so if it's there, you remove it, or if it's missing, you are adding that. So you just put the current uh, state of this class into this element. And this is easy to change, actually, on the fly, you know, the appearance of the page. If you want to have a class, then, of course, you need to have a style sheet that will match these uh, 
CSS style sheet that will message this class name to do something huh, on the element. Or if you don't have a style sheet and you just want to add some style, to apply some CSS rule on those elements, you can use the CSS method, .css, and you will apply uh, this uh, um, value to this attribute, to this CS style attribute. No? It's like writing inside the style attribute of an element. It's not uh, the best way to do that because it's hard coding you know, the, the, the style in the JavaScript code. It's much better to, to work with classes right, rather than directly styles. Uh, which is the difference between these two? The first one is setting just one property. I'm setting the font size to 20. In the second one, I want to set many properties, many style properties at the same time. And so you see the, the braces. Uh, I, have, I have a collection of pairs. It's a dictionary, okay? Uh, so if, uh, and, um, this property, this value, the color property, the red value. to all the P elements in the page, in this case. It will apply to all the paragraphs in our HTML page. Um, and in jQuery, there is also a nice symmetry in which uh, most methods can be used both for writing and reading a value. So you remember the HTML method that I showed a couple of minutes ago? for changing the HTML inside a div element. So if you provide an argument to HTML, it will change the current HTML to that uh, specific text. If you don't provide an argument, then this method will be a query, will return the value of the current value of the included HTML. Uh, if I'm using the, attra method, the attribute method, if I provide two parameters, the one will be the, the first one will be the, uh, the attribute name, and the second is uh, the value to set that attribute to. If I only provide one parameter, then the method, the same method, the same attribute method, will return the current value of that property, of that attribute property. So you don't need to remember a get and a set method for every property. The name of the function is always the same. If you provide a value, then you are setting it. If you don't provide a value, then you are querying it. Hmm? And then you're reading, actually. Uh, so for example, dot eight will give me the current eight of the A method. If I set an eight, then I will change the eight property of the CSS box model, and so on. This is also true for input elements. So the text inputs, the val, which is a slight deviation. The, in HTML, the current value is called value. Hmm? It's a full word, value. In jQuery, it's just abbreviated as val. val. And uh, uh, if you're writing like this, dot val will return you the, the current text of the element. If you pass a parameter to val, you are overwriting or changing the, the value in the input element. So uh, these are the two basically basic functions, how to select the elements with a CSS selector and how to read the values and change values of any property, maybe a style, a CSS, a class, or any other attribute of that element, hmm? all with this uh, simple syntax. That's not all, uh, because sometimes uh, it's easy to find an, an HTML element, but I don't want to change uh, that specific element, but some element near to it or close to it or related to it in some way. Uh, just imagine in this case, we will do that later. The delete button, imagine you want to click the delete button and then, I don't know, I want to highlight this line. So it's easy to find the delete button, but I want to highlight the TR element, the table row element that includes this delete. So depending on which delete I, I click on, 
I want to highlight a specific row. So I need a mechanism for moving from one element to the ones enclosing it, or the other way around to the ones included in it, so that it can navigate in some way the DOM. And for navigating the DOM, there are easy methods. The parent goes up one level, uh, next and previous go left and right in the list of children, all the siblings, and there's also a, no, it's not listed here, um, find method that will only search with the CSS selector inside the, the children and great grandchildren of, of an element. So these are the basic elements for moving from one element to another. By the way, all of these methods still work with collections. This means if that div.section is a div with class equal to section, is if there's only one in the page, div with class section, then the parent will be the bigger div, let's say, that includes that. But if this, if by chance div.section will match many divs in the page, so you have a, a collection of sections, dot parent will give me the collection of all the parents. So we'll apply the parent method to every one of them and then we'll build the collection containing all of them. So actually, it's, it's very powerful. Uh, uh, the same here. The next will be will give me all the elements besides or just after the, all the divs that were matched. Uh, the theory can it seems a bit abstract, but when when we do that on a, on a specific web page, it will get easier to understand. So, selecting elements with jQuery CSS selector, uh, querying attributes dot dot val, dot atra, dot CSS, dot has class. Modifying attributes with dot CSS again to that rev dot value with a parameter. The only missing element is how to attach event handlers. Okay, we already know that attaching event handler is the, with the on click property, but it's better. In jQuery, it's even easier. I match an element or a set of elements and dot click will attach the, an event handler for the click event. So in this line, dollar a, dot f a first dot click, I'm attaching a new handler for the click event to all the links a, all the first ones in the link, in their, in their uh, let's say, section. Every first link will have this click event handler. So I don't need to modify the HTML to add the on-click attribute to an element in order to associate this event tender to that specific HTML element. I can do that directly in JavaScript. So the JavaScript code will register its own event tenders. And so it's easy in the code also dynamically to add a new HTML, a new event tenders maybe as a consequence of other user actions. And uh, here we have this strange syntax. Uh, it's easier to understand when you write it uh, uh, on the code one piece at a time. But uh, usually in this dot click, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, inside this parenthesis, I should have the name of a function, of a JavaScript function, that is the event handler to be called. If I don't want to write the name of a function just for using that name in this specific place, don't, not, 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 just not, I don't want to create functions that it will be used only once, I can also have an inline function definition. So this syntax, wherever JavaScript expects a, a variable, I can define a function. I'm creating a new object of type function with a function keyword, the list of parameters, in this case it's the event that was generated, and then here in line 
I'm providing the body of the function, opening and closing brace for the function. This function is not called now. When I execute this code, the only thing that is done is that uh, an event lender for the click event is registered. And this event lender points to a function. This function has been read and saved somewhere. That function, so this, bo this function body will be called uh, only when the user will click on this link. So I'm defining a function now to be called later. Okay, so this code will be executed much, much later. Uh, why you should, in this, well, in this event ladder, I can do whatever I want. So uh, getting some elements. Uh, so if, if I want to modify the element itself that was uh, the cause of the click, uh, I can use the, this object reference so that I want to modify, in this case, this, the background color or the same link that has been clicked. But otherwise, I can search anything I want. And after the event handler is called, then the browser continues to do its job. So in this case, it was a link, so the HTML page will follow the link. So you are loading a new page. If you want to prevent that, if you don't want the browser to, to, to follow the link, then you can call the prevent default method on the event object, the EV. So for example, for preventing the submission of a form or following a link if some condition is not met, then you set up the page in order to follow the link and then inside the JavaScript handler, you check whether all the conditions are met and so decide whether the link should be followed, okay, or you, want, or you need to prevent it and you just need to call this method once inside the body of the event handler. Um, okay, last point before going to an example. Uh, where do we, or what, or where and when will our JavaScript code will be executed? Uh, the idea was to include the script as late as possible in the page so that when the script is executed, then the page is already loaded. The HTML is already read and analyzed by the browser. So that the JavaScript actually can use the HTML elements and modify them. Uh, it may not be enough because uh, reading the HTML does not mean immediately completing the DOM. The browser needs some time to load also maybe the images, the style sheets, uh, to complete the construction of the DOM nodes. So actually what the browser does is to, uh, the browser will generate an event which, call, which is called ready on the document, on the DOM. So normally we want to execute our JavaScript code only when we are sure that the DOM is ready. So only after the ready event has been generated by the browser, by the DOM, by DOM object. So this is the, the way of doing that in uh, jQuery. Dollar document, so jQuery document, take the document, which is the DOM root element, dollar document means, uh, okay, this was a normal DOM node, I make it, I give the superpowers to that uh, by enclosing that in the jQuery function. So I transform a DOM object into a jQuery object, which has many more capabilities. And on this jQuery object representing the whole DOM, I register an event tender for the ready event. So when the DOM tells I'm ready, call this function. And inside this function, that's all my code. It takes a while not to think in this way because I'm writing code now that will register and if I'm not executing this right now, I'm executing the first line now 
that will schedule for later the execution of the second line. And this later is when the DOM is ready. Hmm? So in our example, how we, do we transform our example from using basic JavaScript to using jQuery? And you see that it's much, much simpler. So let me first wipe out uh, everything we did last time. And also wipe out this uh, event registration. So I had a uh, on click here. It seemed nice at the time, but now we want to, we know we can do better. Hmm? So this is the basic JavaScript, uh, sorry, HTML without any interaction, without any JavaScript, okay? What we had at the beginning last time. So now we want to add the same, uh, say, uh, interaction in, uh, um, in jQuery. So we can work into this to-do list. By the way, if you check the page, uh, the, 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 sorry, the source of the page, sorry, I, the source of the page is here, you see that the jQuery library is already included. Bootstrap uses jQuery internally. So when we are using the Flask Bootstrap uh, uh, templates, uh, jQuery is already included for us. So when the to-do list, our code, is executed, the jQuery library is already loaded. We don't need to load it. We don't need to do anything. Hmm? It's already done for us. So we can immediately write um, here jQuery instructions. So. Uh, yeah, remember what, the, what we were doing? Uh, we wanted to associate an event with clicking on this div, for example, mm -hmm. just for, for seeing how it works. So everything we write, every instruction, every uh, say statement we do in JavaScript, we must be sure that the document is ready. So all our code will be inside one big statement, dollar document, not ready. This is the only JavaScript instruction that is executed immediately here. So when we include the script, uh, I will, uh, I'm only executing this single instruction. This instruction actually expects a function here as an argument, a function name or an inline function. So I can define the function to be called now. Function, not now, sorry, when the document is ready. Parameters, function body. Okay, don't get sick at the, at the parentheses. They will become worse. Just remember what we are doing. All of this is just a single argument to the ready function, okay? So we finish the body. And then this parenthesis closes the argument of the function of the ready function call and then semicolon to finish the statement. Inside this body, we have our JavaScript code that will be executed, will be executed only when the DOM is fully loaded. And so what do we want to do here? We want to, for example, uh, associate an event tender to the Jumbotron div. So let's search for the element that we want. Let's match all the divs with class Jumbotron and associate a click event to all of them, to each of them. In this case, we know there's only one. So we don't write the on-click code on the, in the HTML. The HTML is clean. It doesn't know anything about what we are trying to do with that. In the JavaScript code, we, want, we register the event handlers. The second thing we want to do, for example, is to 
uh, intercept the submission of the form to validate the form before submission. So we can have a, a form on the form element. We register an event for the submit action. The, the individual elements, uh, the buttons and so on, have a click event. But when you click on the submit button, the whole form generates the submit event. Okay, this form is going to be submitted, right? So, we said, when we reach this point in loading the HTML, this only instruction is executed. The execution of this only instruction schedules for later the execution, the execution of these other two instructions, this and that. They will, they are just read now and will be executed when the DOM is ready, which is in a couple of uh, hundred milliseconds probably. Right? These uh, uh, instructions on their turn only register even tenders. And so I can provide here the body of the event tender themselves. So the event tender, I can define it as an external function with a name and provide the name or just I can define it in, in line. And so here I have the body code that is executed when the Jumbotron is clicked. So this code is just read right now and will be executed later when and if at this point the user will click there. Let's try this. So the application is already running. I can refresh it. What's wrong with you? I, did I do something wrong? Insert task, what has to do with me? Oh, sorry. Stupid me. Uh, I didn't comment this instruction. And what happens is that uh, if you are if you are calling an event tender method without a new event tender, the old event tender is called. So right now I'm just submitting the, the, the form as soon as the page is loaded, which is not, uh, that's why we have the loop. Let's command this one until, until we are ready, okay? We are simulating the submission of the form. When we call the, the event handler name uh, function without a parameter. So without setting a new event handler, we are just calling the existing one. We simulate the event. We inject the event in the code, which is not what we wanted. So, uh, no, I need to run it. Be patient. Okay. So right now, nothing's changed. If I click here, I get the gotcha message. That I set in the event handler. Only here, because if I click elsewhere, nothing happens. Here, it will. So, the code that is executed when this event will fire, and this registration only happens when the document is ready. So, it's all thinking about what will happen later. Uh, the for submission, we can do the same. 
So we can, in this case, I probably need the reference to the event. So this is the code to validate the form. Uh, for validating the form, I need to check whether the user has provided some text, uh, where? In the, in the description field. It's called description. So, I want to check var text, the text from the user. I get it from the input with name, so let me use double quotes. In JavaScript, you can use either single or double quotes for strings. Input with name, description. So this will match all the input elements with name description. And we want to get the value of, so up to this point, it's a jQuery node representing a DOM node. Dot val is the string that is inside the value attribute of that node. So it's a string, text is a string. So we can check if text.length is zero, or we can say that, uh, or, or maybe even, even better, if it's less than three, it's too short. So it's a, it's a mistake. We can write that uh, um, alert, for example, text description too short. And then prevent the submission of the form. Otherwise, we can just close. We have nothing to do. So we let the form to be submitted. Or we could also do something nicer, like uh, highlighting in some way the, the input element. So we, can, we, can, we may add some class that, so uh, I don't know, let's check in uh, CS in Bootstrap if we have something that is able to highlight an error, some visual effect. Like the focus style, remove the default line, uh, box shadow, place, disabled. Input with error. I can do it uh, in this way. So the border will turn to red. To red. So I just need to ha to add the. as error class, sorry. Where is that? Yeah, input with error. We add this as error class as feedback. Oh, sorry, it's not the Validation states. 
has warning, has error, has success. So in this case, I need to add the as error class to the parent element, to the group, not to the input element, to its parent. So the index, the input element is uh, here. I need to add an, a class to the div in closing it. So in jQuery is easy because I just get the input element, go to the parent, and then add the class that I already forgot has error. Let's see how it's working. I reload the page. I'm trying to submit the form. Description too short, so I click the event. The submission, the submit event has been generated. I capture that. I read the text, and I found it invalid. And then. It's not easy to see, probably in the projector, but this border turned to red, to red. Okay? We can also do something better, also having the label turn to red. To do that, we need to associate this text, this label, to the input itself. Uh, so this is basic HTML. We need to provide an ID to the, to the input. input description, for example, and we add the for attribute with the same ID. So I'm saying this label, this piece of text, is a text that describes that input element so that the browser knows how to link them. So if we do this simple modification, you see that because by clicking on the label, the cursor will go inside the element. And if the, there is an error, well, this case didn't work, sorry. Uh, this should turn to red also. And let's try what happens if, the, if I write two characters, the same error, but if I write at least three elements, it has been added to the list. Hmm? So it's basic, uh, let's say, functions. And uh, just don't be scared because you see that you have a, at the end of the, of the jQuery, you have a lot of closing stuff. Uh, if you're looking at them right now, probably you are getting lost. And that's why it's better to construct that one piece at a time. By the way, uh, you see that this becomes uh, red, but the red doesn't go away. So it would be nice, for example, to mm, turn it black again after a while, after one second, for example. So what can we do for that, for doing that, for let's say, resetting the error indicator, visual indicator? Oh, what we could do is... Uh, inside this event handler to schedule a new event to happen in one second. So registering a throwaway event handler. That event handler will be only used once and then will be deleted, will be forgotten. So this is the, so the power of being able to register dynamical events. In some condition, I want to register an event, they will only fire in this case. And then in other cases, I don't care about that. Hmm? So for example, uh, let me check because I, in, it's, um, I don't remember exactly the, 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 because it is a basic JavaScript object. Let me, let me search because we don't know, we don't need to have everything by heart, of course.
We have a set timeout function in JavaScript. This is basic JavaScript, nothing to do with jQuery. You don't, you don't need jQuery for doing that. Uh, set timeout can be called, and you provide a function and a value in milliseconds. So this means that it will set a timer when that, after such a number of milliseconds, when that timer expires, this function is called once. If you want it to be recurring, so every second, every half a second, do something, you can set the interval instead of set timeout. So in this case, the event is canceled after the first time is executed. In the other case, it just uh, re-triggers itself. So every 1500 millisecond, 500 millisecond, the, uh, the event will be, um, the function will be called again. And these are methods of the window object. But of course, uh, these are just basic JavaScript methods that can use uh, jQuery functions. So after I set the error on this element, I can set a timeout after maybe one second. And what are you going to do after one second? I need to provide a function that will be called when the second is passed, is expired. And this function will just revert what I did before. So I remove the error class. So we should be able to see the red border turn back to black after one second. So even the real programming is always like that. At this, right now, I'm inserting a function to be fired, to be called later, after a certain time, or when an event happens. So let's see if it works. I'm writing AA, enter. The script is too short, okay. The timer is not, is not set already. I have the alert, which is blocking my JavaScript, and only later the element will be modified. So look below now, red, black again. Okay, so all the animation stuff in JavaScript is uh, relies on timers. I'm changing something and, you know, after inserting this uh, timer, uh, my code can do something else entirely. I forget about that. I'm sure I rely that this function will be called uh, at the proper time. So usually because I can set timers everywhere or event tenders everywhere and then go on with my programming. Actually, as I said before, the only JavaScript instruction which is executed right now is this one. All the rest is that JavaScript code that will be called just in case, in the right conditions, according to the events. Okay? Uh, right now, the only bad, uh, bad thing is this uh, alert function popping up, which is really not very nice. Huh? It would be better to write this error message somewhere else, inside the page, for example. So why don't I just uh, create in the HTML a place for errors? So in my HTML page, I, it would be better to write the error messages here, right beside the text, right beside the form, above or below it. So I could just prepare, for example, a div element right before the form, Uh, a div element, uh, an empty one, 
with class, uh, I don't know if a error works here. Or we, let, let's give it an ID if we think about the classes later. ID is uh, error box. An empty one. So that I can write the error message inside the error box. I, I don't use the alert, which is not nice to see. I just say that uh, the div, sorry, div hash error box will be filled with a, a text which is description too short. And maybe I can also add some visual effect. See if there are some some pieces just to, to add because I want to show you this only works for tables. Well, let me try it with the text uh, if it works. Where is the color? Warning. It's just a stupid example. I'm not even sure that we, whether this class is working here, but uh, I wanted to show you the chaining of methods in jQuery. After I call the text method on this div, and it should be done usually. One nice property is that the jQuery methods will return the, the jQuery object itself. So if I want to call another method on the same object, I can just chain the different calls, one after the other. So I don't need to repeat the div error box dot at the class. I will just add it as we go. So I, if I want to do several modifications to the same element, I can just chain all the method calls one after the other, and they will be executed in sequence. And uh, so I replace the alert, which will not fire anymore. And only the description too short message will be shown here, of course, we need to be uh, to spend some time in working out nice CSS uh, borders and colors for for um, for making it more visible. Uh, and this text is here to stay. Probably when I want to click the button again, I'd like this text to to to, to disappear. So. A nice place to do that is uh, to clear the text here at the beginning. So that it will be emptied before. Hmm? Clear or text with an empty string is the same. But clear, we delete everything, not just the text inside. So that when I click on the button, we'll, it will first clean the error area, and later, if needed, we'll write something that uh, in that element. So you see that inside the JavaScript, you can do, you can transform your web page by adding elements, deleting them, showing, hiding. Another couple of functions which are very useful in JavaScript. Uh, and they're used for menus for our uh, show and hide. 
Evet, diğer. No. S H O W. Okay, I found it. Show and hide will manipulate the visibility of an element. So you can just take a div dot hide, and that part of the page will disappear, will collapse. And if you want to show it, maybe you have uh, some pop-down menu or, or uh, some help text, for example, and you just want to show the help text when the user clicks on that. But you prepare that in the HTML page, and you prepare that in the hidden state. When the user clicks, you just show an element which, which was already there, but the browser didn't show it because it was hidden. So show an either, and you can show it immediately, right now, or you can have a, 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 a small animation for showing it gradually, so for making it appear gradually uh, in, with different uh, effects, say, uh, different easing effects. So it will happen like this, or will fade in with different transparencies. There are different effects that you can apply. So the show and hide are very easy to apply and give you a basic, uh, let's say, animation of an element which is already there, which is already available. Hmm? Or you can change it. As we, as we, as we, as I said. Okay, so this is just the basic uh, ways of animating the content of a, of a web page, make it more interactive. Uh, it's all uh, just uh, eye candy or user friendliness, because the real behavior of the page doesn't change. Sorry, the real behavior of the website doesn't change. The page will behave differently. But the website will insert an element only when I enter the text, and this text is longer than three characters, and so we call the insert text method, uh, and uh, we execute the, <laughs> the insert task page function. So all the JavaScript didn't modify the fact that for, for inserting or deleting element, we need to do these calls and to reload the page. And reloading the page, is, well, the page will reset all the JavaScript that we have in our code. So the next step, and uh, so we need to reload the page and call a different page that will do a task and silently redirect me to the same page as before. So we are reloading the page many times just to change some content. Actually, when, what happens here when I insert a new task, it has, that, uh, it's that I'm recreating an identical page, save for one new line that is, happens here. But the browser doesn't know that. It submits the form, and it navigates to a new page, which, by the way, in our case, is, a, is identical to the first one. And this is very common. So the next step that we do in the next hour is understanding how to modify the web page without reloading it. You say, it's easy. You just need to add one, one row to the, pay, to the table, to the HTML table. But not only, because I don't just want to modify the page. I also want to modify the database in the server with this new element, with this new row, right? So I need a way from my JavaScript code to call a function on the server without changing the page, without reloading the page. In that way, and this function will be probably a REST function. You remember you, we have a REST implementation of the backend of this to-do list. 
Uh, right now we're trying to learn how to call these REST methods from our JavaScript front end. So whenever the JavaScript needs to insert or to delete or to find one new element, it just needs to call that method without needing to submit a form or, or follow a link or in general do any action that will imply reloading the whole page. So in the next hour, so this, this exercise up to now is just a simple website, okay, with some front-end interaction done with jQuery. In the next hour, we will cut the website in two. One REST server and one simple front-end that will have all the logic in JavaScript. And the two will talk with the REST calls. Okay, so during the break, I will prepare a project by putting the REST calls that we, you developed with, the, with Luigi a couple of weeks, weeks ago, then you already worked that with those in the lab, uh, with very simple clients they use them. And today we will do the JavaScript client for calling those methods. So we will recreate this instead of a single traditional web application, like a separate client server application uh, uh, according to REST pattern. Hmm? We need a break for preparing for that. <laughs>